Okay, guys, we're going to get started. Um, I know there's a handful of us that are still going to be trickling in, um, but tonight there is a lot of stuff, so I, I want to respect your time. I want to try to be out of here before 8.30 or by 8.30, okay? That will be a miracle in itself. Okay, um, so before we get started, let's pray before I forget that. <clears throat> Father, uh, we just want to take a second and pause, Lord. Um, we acknowledge that all of our truth, all of our being, everything that we are comes from you, Lord. We want to yield to your Holy Spirit. We pray that you would illuminate truth in our hearts and our minds tonight. God, that you would be teacher. God, that you would give us the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of, of learning. God, that we just may be able to comprehend these topics. God, we pray that all these things glorify you in our questions, um, in our attempt to answer. Um, Lord, we just pray that it all be for your glory. So we welcome you, Holy Spirit. We acknowledge your presence here. And we just pray that you have your way and that you would be king of this classroom. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so tonight... What's up, Jeremy? Um, tonight, as you can see on your paper, we're getting into something called naturalism. Um, naturalism is the worldview that is pretty much created by Darwinism or evolutionary theory. Okay, evolutionary theory in itself... Um, is not a worldview, it's a theory that serves as a foundation for the worldview of naturalism. Okay, so we're going to be talking about why naturalism as a worldview, really as a religion or a belief system, is illogical, and also we're going to be talking about why evolution is philosophically, um, what's the word I'm looking for, insufficient, and also scientifically refuted, um, according to the current academia, but you don't hear about that in the mainstream, and we'll get into that and you'll see why. Okay, it's going to be a lot of fun. Please do not hold your questions, um, or let me rephrase that. Don't be afraid to ask. Obviously, if there becomes a lot of questions, hopefully we'll have time at the end to answer them. But we're going to get into a little bit of evolutionary theory and some of the science behind it. So if you have questions, please, I will go over it again. I will try to speak slower um, and really allow these topics to settle in your mind because they can get, get, can get a little uh, cum cumbersome. Uh, Jeremy, you want to get the door for me, just so we're not distracted? Um, okay, so a little bit, guys. I got my undergraduate in biology. Um, I studied biochemistry, genetics, um, evolutionary theory classes, um, obviously biology, or a lot of stuff like that. I say that just so you know that I have a general understanding of these things. I, I dug into the general topics. I am by no means an expert. I am not a geneticist. I don't really, um, I, I can't speak to the details of certain theories and stuff. But I do feel confident in talking about the general theories. Um, so just know the, the place that I'm coming from, okay? A lot of this is going to be pulling from uh, Stephen Meyer's Darwin's Doubt. He put together an excellent book exposing why Darwinism is illogical um, and is not backed by the scientific evidence, okay? So really I'm pulling a lot from him. Um, and sources here and there, but ultimately, guys, if you're really interested in digging deeper into this stuff, I would, I would uh, suggest you to go to Stephen Meyer's book, Darwin's Doubt. All right, so starting off for tonight, what is naturalism? As I shared briefly, naturalism is a worldview. Um, it was a 19th century British intellectual movement pretty much proposing a way to make sense of reality, of mankind, animals, um, the world we live in. Um, it's just another worldview, which really a worldview can be chalked up to a religion or a belief system as well. Naturalism is the worldview espoused by those who claim that there is no transcendental realm or there is no supernatural reality. There is no God. Um, world, uh, naturalism is typically the worldview of atheists. Right? They typically subscribe to a naturalist worldview. Um, ultimately, it's the belief that nature is all that is. There is nothing outside of nature that exists in reality. Okay? Physical laws, uh, evolutionary theory, um, so on and so forth, is the sum of what is real. That's, that's pretty much what naturalism is. Now, it's important to recognize that before this, um, this intellectual movement in the mid-1800s, when people did biology, when people did, um, when they studied geology or scientific history, stuff like that, it was um, before... Uh, the Enlightenment period, it was thought as intrinsically a theological activity. 
So when people did science, they thought they were naturally studying the order that God himself created. Um, a lot of proponent, uh, some of the proponents of this were William Hewell, John Herschel, um, and William Buckland. Um, again, if you guys are interested, you can go check out some of their work. But it's important to recognize that science wasn't always um, an atheistic uh, discipline. When people did science back in the day before this movement, they believed that they were studying the order of nature that God put in place. Okay? Um, what's up, Michaela? And to that point, we discussed a little bit that um, looking for order in nature is not a natural thing. It's actually hard to locate. You would have to presuppose that there was an order you were searching for when you begin doing scientific inquiry to find order. Right? So it's not like they accidentally stumbled upon laws. They were looking for laws based upon the presuppositions that there was a law maker. Right? You follow me? It wasn't until the mid-1800s, and ultimately really what began the shift was the proposals of Darwin, right? Charles Darwin, he proposed the evolutionary theory. So he proposed this in 1859. Um, uh, scientific philosophers such as Herbert Spencer and Thomas Huxley, um, there's a quote here, it says, they aimed to secularize nature, promote expertise, and obtain independence for scientific investigators from theological dogma, okay? They wanted science to be something separate from philosophy and religion. Um, Huxley and other exponents of scientific naturalism systematically defended this attitude, the goal of which was to eliminate metaphysics from science. Metaphysics being things of like morality, ethics, religion, so on and so forth. Um, contrary to common thought, uh, Darwin actually, actually did not propose the term survival of the fittest. Herbert Spencer did. He used Darwinism and kind of expanded upon it and created his own almost philosophy if Darwinism was true, or evolutionary theory was true, okay? And it's important to recognize that Darwin and Herbert Spencer, Thomas Huxley, their ideas were actually rejected among the academic community when they were first proposed. So the immediate scientific community that they were proposing it to rejected their ideas from a scientific standpoint, but it was accepted in the public, which is interesting, right? They kind of appeal to the public desire, you know, we always want something new, um, same thing with Bart Ehrman when we talked about how he, uh, you know, put forward that the Gospels are not trustworthy. Obviously, if you write a headline on New York Times or whatever that the Bible isn't actually true, people are going to bite to that rather than the Bible is true. We've been right the whole time, right? So it's just funny to think about how Darwinism uh, kind of caught fire, not based upon the scientific community, but, um, but based upon its approval in the public, okay? Just an important point to make there. Okay, so pretty much, uh, where am I, generally among the public, yeah. So, so it's important to realize that naturalism as a worldview that typically atheists would employ is the result of Darwinism, evolutionary theory, and the like, right? Um, now we pretty much find ourselves in a society where if you don't believe in evolution and you believe in God and you believe the Bible, you're automatically deemed as um, unintellectual, right, ignorant and foolish, and those who espouse naturalism, atheism, and evolutionary theory, those are the ones who have a logic and reason on their sides, right? That's a pretty fair statement, right? I, I think Christians are often marginalized as unintellectual, right? And we're going to get into why that is so not the case. Now, before we get into that, I just want to kind of uh, elucidate naturalism a little more. So let's talk about what exists in naturalism, okay? Now, again, this is not going to be exhaustive, but just a couple of the key elements to naturalism. So what exists in naturalism are the physical laws, okay? The physical laws, or the laws of nature, are the things that govern reality. They are the only things that govern reality, right? Um, Thomas Huxley referred to such laws on um, the atomic theory of matter, the principle of the conversion, conservation of energy, um, the theory of evolution as testaments to this claim. So these, there are some fundamental laws in the universe that dictate how the universe works. Nothing else. That's it. There's these laws set in place. This is how the universe operates. Okay? Number two, um, we're going to go back to this big word that I hope you guys remember. Am I spelling that right? Who said it? Epistemology. Well said. Do you remember what it is? What it refers to? I actually just read it. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> Does anyone remember what epistemology is? Come on. Make me happy. Jesse. It's uh, basically the it's like the study of ancient documents. Um, not epistemology. Epistemology is the study of knowledge. Um, it's a philosophical, um, pretty much, how do we know what we know? Why do we believe what we believe? 
Um, so epistemology in this worldview of naturalism pretty much says that the only way we can come to knowledge or know things is from the scientific method, right? Um, sight, taste, touch, all that stuff, right? The, the, um, our five senses and the, under the scientific method is the only way we can obtain knowledge, okay? That's what epistemology is. Anything that's metaphysical, such as moral knowledge, um, um, ethics, things like that cannot be considered knowledge, rather opinion, right? So true knowledge is only attained by the scientific method in the worldview of naturalism, okay? Um, another one I want to talk about is human nature, okay? This is a big one and very important. And, um, unfortunately, a lot of atheists don't want to follow this where it leads, but in naturalism, human nature is not separate from the, the forces of nature, right? So being human is no separate than the nature around us. We are just products of evolution. There's real no meaning to this universe. It's just chaos, random chances, random forces, and that's how we got here today. There is no meaning, there's no human meaning, there's no purpose. Um, you're pretty much just the result of random forces over time. Okay? This can obviously lead to an existential crisis, right? And I think we kind of see that, especially when you're taught this in public schools that it's fact. You're just an evolved ape. There's no purpose. You can make it whatever you want. Okay? Again, that's going to lead to some problems. And under this, under this worldview, there are, is no morality objectively. Okay? Any questions so far, guys? Are we good? Um, and, and to kind of cap off that point with, with human nature, the only thing that separates mankind from other animals is the degree to which we evolved. That's it. We are nature, right? We are the product of evolution. So again, we're just animals. Hey Mason, how do you make the leap to that? You say there's the, therefore no morality. It's not built into this uh, naturalism. Thing. So naturalism does not believe, or those who espouse naturalism yeah. do not believe in a transcendental reality. So in order for more... You can observe it, you're saying you can't feel it? Sense. No, it doesn't exist. Right. Um, so because they don't believe anything exists outside of nature, then a moral law, like we discussed last time, could not exist objectively. Morality is now rendered to the subjective evolution of our species. So I'm only moral because I have evolved this way. So morality is a subjective thing. It's not an objective law, right? Um, and we talked, we, we talked briefly last yeah. class. Um, therefore, rape is not objectively wrong. It's just we've evolved as a species to not like it. You see, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, so that's, that's kind of how morality is ruled out, and along with things like love um, and justice. They don't exist objectively. They exist subjectively. For example, love, as a human would experience it, is really just chemicals in the brain that is designed to help you reproduce. That's all it is. We're just kind of really sex-crazed robots <laughs> functioning according to our genes, if evolution is true. Do, do you follow that? So, so let me just rephrase that. Morality can exist in the sense of subjective ethics, where it's really just opinion based on your genes. Um, but objective morality cannot exist in naturalism. Okay. And then ultimately, it gets adopted as a social norm. Exactly. That's how we see exactly. moral law. Exactly. Um, which is a problem we talked about last class. Slavery was legal at one point. People liked it. People thought it was a good thing. Um, but we look back on the abolishment of slavery, we know that, that abolishing slavery was a good thing. Why? Because morality is not subjective to the times that we're in, it's an objective law. And enslaving African American race is an evil thing, right? Okay. So I, I love this quote by Richard Dawkins, okay? So, well, I don't want to drop that point right there. So, but, but at that time, no, no one really objected to it. Actually, I don't want to say no one objected to it, but where were the Christian views? I thought even back in the biblical days, there was slavery, various forms of... Yeah, um, now get... Stuff, right? so. Yeah. Now, that's a whole rabbit hole. Okay. Um, slavery... Yeah, yeah. Slavery, let me just touch on real quick. Slavery in the sense of what we understand to be slavery, yeah. um, for example, when um, we enslave African Americans, um, and slavery in the Bible are a little different. Um, uh, for example, it was more of the idea of an indentured servant. Sure. Yeah. Um, and I, we can keep going down that. Um, but I think the point is, is that the North was objectively right for abolishing the practices of the South. It wasn't the case, you could argue, if you um, are a proponent of subjective morality, you would have to say that it wasn't the fact that it was right to abolish slavery, it was the fact that the North imposed their own opinion on the South, and almost like might is right type of thing, you know? So just because a majority of people 
um, subscribe to that, right? If I go to a, uh, some island and on that island they eat children, right? Just because the majority of them eat children on the island does not make it objectively morally correct that they eat children, you know? Are you, are you following that? Yeah, but see, that's to that group. There, there, there isn't a problem. It's to the larger audience. It's just like us. We could have changed our opinion over something mm -hmm. 200 years from now, mm -hmm. and then it becomes, you know, the... Now, let me ask you a question. Do you think that, um, do you think over time, we would, humanity will become so, I, I have to care, be careful with my words, but um, do you think humanity would become so depraved that all of a sudden, in some universe, we think rape is right? Yeah, I, I, probably not that extreme. And that's extreme. Um, and the reason why I... But we're blurring the lines of a lot of things that we thought were objectively right and wrong. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, absolutely. absolutely. Um, and I... This is not to say that we do not just adopt the subjective tendencies of our culture. We absolutely do. And the lines have become blurred. That's why we need a special revelation from God to reveal that to us. Um, but... It goes back like the Ten Commandments are always going to be... Yes. Know, yes. Uh, objectively yeah. Objectively measured. They're not going to be... Right. Kind of and and you can do eight out of ten. Yeah, yeah. And and we go back to epistemology. How do we know what we know? We really just believe things in our heart, right? In my soul, I know certain things right. are wrong. It's right. just wrong. You look at a child, right? Um, if you tell a child not to take a cookie, and they take a cookie and you go up to that child and say, Did you steal a cookie from the counter? They're usually gonna be like, No. Because they know their guilt by going against what you said. You know, just because deep down they know it was wrong that they went against what you said. Um, so morality, yeah. morality is a whole rabbit hole, but it's a good conversation. So anyway, Richard Dawkins, he says in an uh, interview with an Austrian newspaper, he says, no decent person wants to live in a society that works according to Darwinian laws. A Darwinian society would be a fascist state. Okay, now Richard Dawkins is a proponent of naturalism, right, but he, and Darwinism, but he himself says you don't actually want to live like Darwinism is true because then if it was true, then Hitler technically was onto something, right? He was exalting a superior race and trying to exterminate the, the bad races. Ultimately, he was just trying to speed up evolution. So according to naturalism, Hitler was not really that far off, which is kind of a crazy thing to think about. Okay, and again, if there's no morality, then us stopping Hitler was just our opinion against his. Okay, so, so those are some key things. Um, there are, we're going we're gonna to touch on two aspects of naturalism. I skipped a lot. Hold on. What doesn't exist, thank you. I don't know how I always do that. What doesn't exist, okay. So uh, we can briefly touch on that because actually, Frank, you talked about objective morality, right? So um, I love this quote by Bertrand Russell, a proponent of naturalism. He says, the man, or that man is the product of causes which had no prevision of the end they were achieving. That his origin, his growth, his hopes and fears, his loves and his beliefs are but the outcome of accidental co-locations of atoms. There's no, there's no beliefs. There, all those things are just the product of evolution, including morality. So there's no objective morality in this worldview. There is no intelligent creator or a mind behind the universe. It was all created, um, um, chaotic, random forces. And there is no free will in human meaning. Okay? Something that's very interesting, in, and if evolutionary, th evolutionary theory is true, then we are genetically predetermined. We are actually locked into our genes. We have no free will. My genes have already dictated who I will be, how I will act, and what I'll believe. Okay? There's no real free will in naturalism. Okay. Sir. Um, so would you say that naturalism completely rejects any type of epigenetics? Completely rejects epigenetics? Yeah. We'll get into that. I'm sorry. Epigenetics is later. Yes. Okay. And that's, a, that's, again, it's a whole the rabbit hole we're just going to graze across. But no, they don't reject epigenetics, which is why it's illogical. I was about to say, they would have to. Right. right. Okay. okay. So there are, there are two things in the worldview of naturalism that we're going to tackle today that are of a big issue. Um, they are scientism, which is a philosophical, I guess, presupposition, and evolutionary theory. Um, now, again, evolutionary theory, that's going to be a fun one. Just because evolution is such a well-received theory today, you just kind of believe it just because they teach it to you in, in high school and you think it's true. 
Scientism is actually one of the more sneaky philosophies that kind of go under the radar. But it's actually one of the big foundations for naturalism. So the belief of scientism, this is J.P. Moreland. J.P. Moreland, um, we've talked, we've, we've used a lot of his works in this class. He says, he's a Christian philosopher, he says, like it or not, we can't just bury our heads, bury our heads in the sand regarding the power and per pervasiveness of scientism in our culture. It will affect Christians negatively if the leaders of the church and parents are not equipped to recognize when scientism is being promoted in a movie, on television, or elsewhere, and to know how to provide a reasoned response to it. I agree. Scientism is very dangerous, okay? Um, so the question of, of scientism, um, pretty much you can boil scientism down to this. Most central to the belief system of scientism is that Science and its methods provide the only fully valid route to gaining knowledge and for answering questions to the exclusion of other methods and disciplines, right? So this goes along with the epistemology, what I was saying, okay? There are two forms of scientism. You have hard and you have soft, okay? So hard scientism is pretty much the idea that we can only call something knowledge if it's provable by the scientific method. Or in other words, we can only call something knowledge if I can observe it and test it in a laboratory. Okay? Bertrand Russell says, whatever knowledge is, obtain is attainable must be attained by scientific methods, and what science cannot discover, mankind cannot know. Okay? So th that's hard scientism. There is no knowledge outside of science. If you can't prove it in a laboratory, you can't know it to be true. Now, soft scientism, or weak scientism, is the idea that you can know other realms of knowledge that is knowable, but ultimately science has the authority and all other realms of knowledge have to bow to it. So for example, if I want to say that it is objectively if, um, a moral fact, I want to call something objectively true, that it's morally wrong to do this thing, I can say that as long as I'm not contradicting what science has to say about that. Science is the ultimate authority, okay? that's, and that's soft scientism, meaning it will allow for other knowledge but um, science ultimately is the authority. All right, so I want to quickly demonstrate why this is very illogical and makes no sense, okay? Let's go back to what Bertrand Russell said. Whatever knowledge is attainable must be attained by scientific methods, and what science cannot discover, mankind cannot know. I think that quote was cut off my paper. The last term, uh, it says, mankind cannot know, okay? But based on that claim, one is forced to ask Bertrand Russell, how did you come to this conclusion? You're making a claim that what cannot, what is not attained by scientific methods, then you cannot know it, right? You're forced to ask him, did science discover that claim? Did you use the scientific method to analyze and prove that claim? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, for Bertrand Russell, the claim he's making is philosophical and not scientific. Mm -hmm. So what he's saying is that if I can't study and look, look at it in a laboratory, then I can't know it. But that claim itself cannot be studied or looked at in a laboratory. You see that? The issue is, is he's making a philosophical claim while trying to say that science is the authority. Right? So against hard scientism, it's very illogical. I'm not going to write out the proof on the board, but you see it on your paper, right? So the first premise, that which is true can only be attained by a scientific method. Second premise, one was not used, was not attained using the scientific method. Then the, the conclusion, therefore, one must be false by its own claim. It's called a self-refuting statement, right? Do you guys see that? Do you want me to repeat that in, in other words? So, so would, wouldn't that argue against anything that is labeled that is a theory? How so? So the theory of evolution, for example, cannot be uh, reproduced in a laboratory. It cannot be, it cannot be scientifically observed. Yeah. And yeah. Therefore, we can't know it. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't mean it's false. Or, it doesn't mean it's true or false. Mm -hmm. it, it, it. Yeah. Um, and I think some people would say, well, we have observed evolution. Um, and we'll get into what they actually mean by observed. Um, but you're right. You're, you're pretty much saying that any type of philosophy, right, because philosophy itself cannot be observed, right? right? So when you're attempting to make that claim, you're automatically refuting yourself because it's a philosophical claim. And it's the same thing for weak scientism, right? Um, so quickly look at that, that, uh, the line of argumentation there, right? If I say that scientific claims have the highest authority to tell us what is true, but 
that claim itself is a philosophical claim. Therefore, then philosoph um, philosophy has authority over science, making my premise, my whole thing false. You, are you guys following? Let me repeat it again. So this is against weak scientism, right? The claim that other places can have knowledge, but science is authoritative. When I say science is the authoritative realm of knowledge, that claim itself is a philosophical claim. So I'm indirectly saying that philosophy actually comes before science. So I'm already self-refuting myself. Do, for, soft so for soft scientism. But, but the same argument still stands. The, the whole problem is that scientism itself is a philosophy. So when you claim that science is the ultimate means of knowing, you're automatically contradicting yourself because you're making a philosophical claim. You guys, you guys follow me there? I know it's a little bit of a, of a headache. Michaela, do you get it? Kind of? OK. I'm accepting for what it is. Let me try one more time. Um, Lord, give me wisdom. How do I explain this? Um, uh, blah, 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 blah. Oh yeah. And and we're gonna get we're gonna get to Darwinism. Um it's always described as it's like they they always throw in those three Yeah. 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 And we'll get into that and why it's actually unlikely. Um but I kinda I wanna try to drive this home from Michaela, okay? I'm not leaving until you understand this, okay? <laughs> Okay, okay. All right, so Michaela, watch. Okay. Now, obviously, it's not just for Michaela. I'm sure, I, I'm sure there's other people who aren't brave enough to say. Right, um, let, me, let me try to think of this real quick. Um, okay, so when I'm doing science, right, um, let's say I'm trying to observe gravity, right, and I drop my marker. Okay. I can record the time that it took to fall to the table and take notes, okay? I would call that science because I'm making observations, right? But I am assuming that I can trust my eyes to tell me the truth about reality, right? If I can't trust my eyes, then all of my conclusions scientifically mean nothing. So philosophy comes before science. I must assume that I can think well in order to observe and make calculations about gravity. So technically, I forgot the term here, but technically philosophy is higher. Exactly. Exactly. Oh. Good job. So, <laughs> so scientism <laughs> claims. I teach elementary. This is not for me. <laughs> so scientism claims that it's the other way around, but it's self-refuting. It makes no sense. Um, and you know, I, I have a little bit on here about the death of first philosophy, where we all of a sudden have found in this. Um, in this 21st century that science takes authority over philosophy and that makes no sense. It's very uh, counterintuitive. Um, Etienne Gilson, he's a Christian philosopher. He says, philosophy is the only rational knowledge by which both science and nature can be judged. By reducing philosophy to pure science, man has not only abdicated his right to judge nature and to rule it, but he has also turned himself into a particular aspect of nature, subjected like all the rest to necessary law which regulates its development. Okay, we don't have to dig deeper into that, but pretty much if, um, if I cannot, if logic and reason are not realities that I can think on and philosophy doesn't come before science, then I myself am a part of the, the science going on, right? I'm just chemicals functioning. I'm not actually a brain who think, or I'm not actually a mind who thinks well, right? I'm just science. And how can that science observe the surrounding science? Um, I'm, I'm inseparable from the, the nature that goes on around me. Um, and this gives new meaning to Albert Einstein, who, who has this famous quote. He says, the man of science is a poor philosopher. And we really see that in this, um, this presupposition of, I mean, I, I won't even say scientists, of just people in general. They just think science is the authority. And that's actually poor logic and poor reasoning. Science is not the authority, um, philosophy is. Etienne Gilson, I believe, was a Christian philosopher. Let me actually I'm gonna check that right now. 
Um, I've read a handful of his just excerpts from him. Yeah, yeah. Um, he was a French philosopher, history and of philosophy, um, and he was Christian. So uh, he proposed a lot of uh, Thomas Aquinas, uh, you know, uh, existence for a creator, stuff like that. So yeah, he was uh, really cool. Okay. Any questions on scientism? We understand why scientism makes no sense. Okay, so I, I, really, I really hope that you guys can be confident when people say things that like, oh, well, science, well, this is what science says, or science is the authority, okay? It's not. Philosophy is. And technically, the things that we know philosophically cannot be proven, right? It goes back to epistemology. How do we know what we know, right? So, again, it's all faith. It really just it boils back down to class, I believe that was class three. Okay, so we... Okay, so we kind of show that scientism makes no sense in this worldview of naturalism and already kind of took an ax to that worldview. Now we're going to talk about evolution. This is the fun stuff, okay? So I really, who just yawned? Sorry. Was that you? Yeah. I need you to, I need you to focus, no, 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 I'm just joking. But I need you to focus here, okay? Because I really, this will be really rewarding if you can understand this well, Okay. We're going to get into a little bit about evolutionary theory. So I really need you just to stick with me, and I promise in the end it will, it will be uh, rewarding to our Christian worldview. Okay, so um, where do I want to start with this? Um, okay, so evolutionary theory is pretty much Darwin, Darwinism. Um, you may hear this term, neo-Darwinism. Don't let that scare you. It's really just using what we found about genetics currently and kind of throwing it in on top of Darwin's theory. Okay? It's really just evolutionary theory. The, it's the idea, um, and right here is just the quick Wikipedia definition of evolution, um, stating that all species of organisms arise and develop through the natural selection of small inherited variations that increase the individual's ability to compete, survive, and reproduce. Okay? It's really important to recognize that we do not observe evolution. Evolution is a forensic science, meaning we look at the past, we look at what we have, or we look at today, the evidence we have from the past, and we draw conclusions, okay? We have not observed evolution in the sense of macroevolution. We have never once observed a species turning into a species. Now, we have observed microevolution, but microevolution is a kind of a deceiving term. It's really just adaptation. It's adapting to your environment, which sounds to me like something a creative, um, a creator, an intelligent creator would put into us, okay? It's just important to realize. When we look at the facts of science, we are drawing conclusions based on those facts. And that's what evolutionary theory is. Um, for example, people might say that, well, look, we share, um, a lot of organisms share much of the same DNA. That must prove that evolutionary, evolutionary theory is true. But I can take the same fact and I can say, common DNA actually proves we have the same creator, right? Um, just like a Microsoft program, um, Microsoft Word, Excel, PowerPoint, may share a lot of the same code, but it doesn't imply that they evolved. It implies that it had the same Microsoft company creator behind it, right? So it's just important to understand that there are no facts of evolution, right? We all have access to the same facts. It's the theory and conclusion that is made off of those facts, all right? So when people say that science proves evolution, it's actually a, it's a very misleading thing to say, okay? So really quick, how did this theory come about? Um, 1859, Charles Darwin proposed Darwinism. If you guys want to go deeper into it, you can. Um, pretty much Darwin's finches and on the origin of species, Darwin concludes all of his research findings. Pretty much, he found that on the Galapagos Islands, there's these finches, these, these birds there. And he saw that dependent on their different types of beaks, they were able to retrieve seeds in a more efficient way. And because the retrieval of seeds adds to their ability to reproduce and adds to their survival rate, then certain beak types would get favored over time. And so pretty much over a long period of time, let's say the sharp beak was best for getting seeds, then therefore the sharp beak would be um, better perpetuated um, in later generations. Okay, you're following that, right? That's, that's on the basis what evolution is. So Charles Darwin observed what? Adaptation. And then he extrapolated that theory and said not only do birds with different beaks go to birds with different beaks, but by that same mechanism, we went from a single-celled organism to a human. Okay? That's ultimately what Darwinism is. Okay? Now, there are two different mechanisms that act 
on our genes to have the diversity of species that we see today. Okay? This is where I really need your attention. Okay? So check this out. You have DNA. Okay? DNA is like the software program for life. Okay? It's the code. Okay? Now, um, DNA will produce certain traits in us. Let's say thick hair, right? So we'll call them traits. Okay? Thick hair. If I am in a cold environment, right, then that thick hair will improve my ability to survive and reproduce. You're following me, right? Mm -hmm. So a certain genetic trait will be acted upon natural selection, okay? Right? And in this case, natural selection would be the cold, right? So therefore, because of this trait for long hair and because of the cold weather that I'm surrounded with, that trait gets passed on to the next generation because it increases my fitness, okay? And fitness, again, is just a way of saying um, my ability to reproduce and my ability to survive, okay? And so because of that, it goes on to the, I would just say, next gen, okay? And so therefore, this genetic trait gets passed on. And then over time, you watch natural selection almost pick and choose which traits come about, okay? Does that then circle back to DNA? And then it circles back, right? Because, because it's informing the, the code. It's changing the code. Yeah, D DNA, um, well, well, again, let's say you, you had another genetic um, code for thin hair. And the thin hair caused that species to um, freeze to death. Therefore, that species has a less fitness rate. Oh, right. So it wouldn't pass it on because it died. So it doesn't necessarily go back and inform the code. The code just sustains. It sustains. It doesn't inform the code. Okay? The, the, the code sustains, which again begs the question, where did DNA come from in the first place? We already talked about that. Okay, so natural selection is one mode. Okay? You guys follow me? Okay, so same thing stands. You have genetic code, which creates certain traits in an organism, but you can also have something called mutation. Okay? And then mutation does the same thing, right? In accordance with natural selection, right? So, whoops. In um, the replication process, right, when I'm passing my genes on to the next generation, your genes replicate. In that process, you can have a mutation. And what will happen is this genetic code will be altered, okay? And when it's altered, it may create a new trait that increases my fitness and therefore passes on to the next generation. You following that? Okay. Very basically, that is the theory of evolution. Natural selection and mutation are the mechanisms by which DNA is selected, certain, and now there's a diversity of species. Go ahead, Phil. So then what's the role of like, you know, like a parent, like two parents' DNA mm -hmm. in that mutation selection process? Um, absolutely. So now we're getting into like, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, uh, someone biology, help. Uh, recessive. Recessive and dominant genes, right? Um, uh, blue eyes are recessive, so they don't show up. Um, you absolutely get into all that, and there's all this mixing now, and um, now certain genes get expressed. But the fact remains that the genes still, the code is still there, right? So if you get half of Phil's genes, half of Phil's wife's genes um, into a baby, right, technically, this process that happened still contributes to that next gen. There is no new code except by these things. Okay? The, the diversity of genetics doesn't change. I look confused. Yeah. <coughs> I'm, just, I'm just, like, that doesn't sound like what you just said. Like, what I gathered from what you said there was that, like, it was just simply your existence that changes DNA. Like it was like it was your surroundings that did it, not actual like genetic. Okay, so think of natural selection as the external surroundings that affect it. I would even put in um, parents into like this external factor. Um, there's other things: um, migration, genetic flow, gene drift. There's these other things that yes do contribute to that. I, there's no reason to get into those things there. So you're definitely right, um, but it's important to recognize that the code from the parents itself didn't change. It's just 
what gets expressed changes, and the amount of code that the baby receives changes. But in the replication process, the code might mutate. That's, the, that's what I'm referring to. It, like the code itself might actually, like there might be a blip in your, your, whatever, your biological functioning that causes a, a code change. Austin, go ahead. And mutations are random, correct? Yes, mutations are random. Mutation occurs if it just so happens to increase the fitness or life expectancy of the being, then it will persist. Yes. Is that correct? That is correct. So it doesn't always benefit. No, no, no. Right. The mutation does not guarantee fitness. And we're going to get into that. Okay? I just want, for now, it's really important to understand the basic dogma of evolution. Um, do, do you have any more questions on that? There are a lot of um, things sprinkled in on top um, that people have attempted to do use to um, explain naturalism and that worldview. But ultimately, this is the foundational theory that was proposed by Darwin. Okay? The environment selects certain genes and it gets passed on, and random mutations will edit genes, and then those will get passed on. Are we following? Yeah. Any other questions before we move on? Please do not hesitate. Phil, do you kind of understand? Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Um, but you, you're absolutely right. Parents, um, it's, a whole, it's a whole different thing there. But this is not a biology or genetics class. OK. And I am not a genetics teacher by any means. Um, OK, so there are two issues that I'm going to raise today with evolution. The first issue is the philosophical issue of evolution. Evolution is concerned with fitness. This is the mechanism by which genes are passed on, your ability to reproduce and your ability to survive. Evolution is not concerned with the organism's ability to gain truth. Okay? That is not the ultimate goal. The goal of evolution, again, directed by increasing fitness rate, is to survive and reproduce, not necessarily know truth. So let's say you have a trait that will allow you to know what is true versus a trait that increases your fitness. What is evolution going to choose? Fitness, not your ability to know truth. So that begs the question, how do we know that all of our faculties that have evolved over time help us tell the truth if it's not geared towards truth? My eyes. How do I know my eyes are communicating reality to me if evolution does not favor truth but fitness? Go ahead. You can make the argument that my eyes have evolved to the point where I can detect any threats to me, therefore I can react. Right. So, so so in essence, it's a narrowing of my field of view to just those things that are in Right. So it may, it may be a perspective of, of the truth, of the reality of, of, that exists. I see everything as a threat. Mm -hmm. But not necessarily the, the truth, the objective truth. Right, not the objective you're, truth. You're, it's subjective because it, it's geared towards my fitness. To your fitness. Um, and also, we have to remember that natural selection and mutation are random events. Weather is random. It's undirected, right? Mutation are, is random. So think about this example. Again, please follow me. Imagine if I am on a train and I'm going into a city, okay? And I see a formation of rocks as I'm entering the city and it says, welcome to Portland. Because I'm entering a city and I see a rock formation that says, welcome to Portland, I'm gonna assume what? That I'm entering Portland. But what if someone said, oh, you see those rocks there that say, welcome to Portland? That was actually formed out of an earthquake and a hurricane. Because the Welcome to Portland rocks are the product of random forces, I'm now less inclined to believe that the city I'm entering is Portland. Because it was the product of random chaotic forces. In the same way, my eyes were formed from random chaotic natural selection and mutation. So why would I assume that it's telling me what is true when it was just random forces? It's crazy, right? It doesn't make any sense. This is the philosophical, um, I guess, problem with evolution. Okay? Let's take it a step further, and we kind of touched on it. Then that means my mind and the way I think is also determined by the same random chaotic forces, not by intelligence. Right? So then that means my thinking capabilities are dicta dictated by my genetic presuppositions, or my uh, predispositions, right? Bertrand Russell, we're going to go back to his quote. He says, well, you do have bi we have biases, though, you know, in us. I think that that's true, though, right? But according to evolution, those biases are genetic. 
They are not separate okay. from the evolutionary process. They're not learned? That's what I thought they'd be subject to. Yeah, so they're not learned? Your ability to learn. Say that again? Your ability to learn is genetically predisposed. There is nothing, there is nothing outside. You are a programmed robot according to your DNA. That's it. There's nothing else. There's no You're saying we have blank slate. No, no, no. You have a program yeah. and you operate according to that program. So we're not blank. We're blank. You're not blank. You're programmed. And whatever, whatever you do and function in life is based on this program. Now, I'm not saying you can't learn and I'm not saying you can't gain biases, but the gaining of those things is all under the umbrella of your ability that's granted to you by your genes. You're a robot. Robots can learn, but only because of the code. According to evolution, that's what you are. Wow. Just your genes. You're just a, f a function genetic, a genetic robot. So let's go back to Bertrand Russell's comment. He says, that man is the product of causes which had no prevision of the end they were achieving. That his, his, um, that is, no, no, that his origin, his growth, his hopes and fears, his loves and his beliefs are but the outcome of accidental collocations of atoms. Do you guys see the issue with that? Mm -hmm. Russell's own claim that he's making is the result of accidental co-locations of atoms. The belief system of naturalism itself, right? You're genetically predisposed to believe naturalism. I had a friend say to me once, um, oh, you're only a Christian because your genes dictated that you be a Christian. I'm like, well, you're only an atheist because your genes dictated you be an atheist. If evolution is true, then that means you are constantly genetically predetermined to believe what you're going to believe. You have no free will. You are locked into the evolution that has been dictated from, from the process. Go ahead. If we see this idea of us being robots, mm -hmm. right? Robot, like you're given a task as a robot, right? When you're creating, you have this code, right? So your code is ultimately going, like, created so that you complete your task. This task would be to survive and perpetuate your genes, mm -hmm. right? So there would be nothing coded into you that would be in conflict with your ability to perpetuate your genes. Right. right. Well, 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 those things would get selected out over time. Uh, right, right. So technically, if you were coded to be a Christian, being a Christian, everything that comes with it would go against the perpetuation of Absolutely, genes. yeah. So technically, Christians should have died out. Uh, True. Strong. Now, you could raise your argument, well, your belief is a powerful thing that drives your species forward. Okay. You could say that. You know, but you raise a good point. Selflessness will soon die out. Um, the idea of a hero jumping on a grenade for his team, that's going to die out. Or a parent caring for a sick child. Well, you could say the child perpetuates your genes. Yeah, but if it's, if, yeah, but you would, but instinct would, would, would require that I create another child and let that. Could be. Child it could be. Absolutely. It could be. Go ahead, Jeremy. I'm just thinking because, like, adding to that, sort of the DNA of like some people in their DNA are much more emotional. So it's like because they're more emotional, they're going to be more caring. They're going to care value lives higher than other people who are less empathetic. Mm -hmm. So, for example, the diving on a grenade to like protect others, that it's like they're two separate clear paths. I'm just. Clarifying. But wouldn't that die out though? Wouldn't that trait die out? Because it, it goes against self perpetuation. It goes against. Oh, okay. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes, over time. Well, According. Greater because you're protecting a greater good by itself. There is no greater good. But remember, but listen to this, Frank. Listen to this. Evolution is selfish. It's immediately concerned with your own perpetuation and your own genes carrying on. So you jumping on a grenade is not favored by evolution. And honestly, ironically, us praising the hero who jumps on a grenade is actually absurd. Because technically, if evolution is true, then that was not a good thing he did. He is not, it's stupid. He's not perpetuating his species. If we are just genetically predisposed robots. Okay. Um, I have a couple quotes here. What time we got? It's already eight. Okay. Um, so, so listen to this quote. Nevertheless, the fundamental dilemma remains. How can our observations and anal analytical ideas and theories be trusted if modern naturalism is true? They are not independent of the process of cause and effect. Observations and theoretical interpretations are subject to false assumptions, poor logic, prejudice, misunderstanding, misperception, and carelessness. But the most serious concern by far is the problem of the mind's lacking independence from the chemical and physical process it is supposedly studying. 
What he's saying here is that there is no you. There is no self. You are just evolution, working and functioning, moving forward. All you are are chemical processes that are just functioning, fizzing and popping, and you're an operating robot according to your genes. So what he's saying is, you're not independent from the science that you're attempting to observe. There is no self. There is no, there is no mason. I'm just my genes that have been passed on throughout, throughout time. Scientists are just evolution studying evolution. Jesse, go ahead. No, no, no. Um, this comes from, I believe, no, this is, this is uh, Russ Bush, um, L. Russ Bush. Um, this book is excellent for this stuff. His name is L. Russ Bush. I, it might be Lester. Yeah, it's on the citation. He wrote the book, The Advancement, Keeping the Faith in an Evolutionary Age. That is a phenomenal book, and it's a short read. Go ahead, Nate. So I had a question about um, like something like that you previously spoke about. So basically, like, so like, you know how like, people may have like, bad thoughts of like, you know, like, killing themselves. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Wouldn't like, evolution try to like, get rid of that, maybe, possibly? Over time? Yeah. Absolutely. It would be like a malfunction. It would be a malfunction. And technically, now again, hear me from the naturalist point of view, why would we try to save those people if naturalism is true? If evolution is true and we're trying to perpetuate a good species, why would we save those people with that fault or that genetic blip? Right, right. It becomes a scary world if we live according to evolution. And if evolution is true, this reality is a very dark reality. But ultimately, the funny thing is, is that if naturalism is true, you cannot claim it to be true. Because again, I am genetically, genetically determined in my mind. There's no laws of logic. I'm operating according to my own genes. So when I claim naturalism is true, technically I don't know that it's true. You see, you see what I'm saying? I am not free from my genes to observe truth objectively. My mind and my reasoning is all locked in according to my genes. So everything I see in reality is according to my genetic lens. So the naturalist who says naturalism is true is automatically self-refuting himself. Do you guys see that? It's a, yeah, it's, it's insane. Yeah, it's mind game. And this is what I love, though, because Jesus is the voice of truth. So where we follow truth where it leads, you see how the devil has slipped his way into these theories. What you hear these theories, and you're like, this, this sounds pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> you have to pay attention. When, you, when you're talking about this, it just reminds me of the natural mind that we keep hearing in the Bible. Mm, the exactly, carnal the mind. carnal mind, absolutely. Yep. Did someone have a question? Yeah, I, I, I did, but you've got the same person arguing the self refuting statement, right? That naturalism is, is true. Argue that, well, we actually don't, we can't know, therefore it could be true, therefore that other thing could, could be false. You, you know what I mean? It introduces the, could it, could it make the, the claim that we actually can't know? Either way, so there's yeah. a likelihood. You know, is is that is, is does okay? Well, now, so now we're, you're kind of touching on something called critical theory, where you're not actually observing reality; you're observing what what works. So it gets out of the realm of science. It gets out of the realm of science and becomes philosophical, which again is a violation right. of the tenets of naturalism. Right. So the question I had before, um, you don't have to answer it now, but can scientism exist? outside of naturalism? Can scientism exist outside of naturalism? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I've seen Christians who are scientistic. Right. I mean, we tend to say, I will believe my Bible as long as it um, bows to science. Okay. Scientism is just exalt... No, you don't have to be a naturalist. Okay. But, but a according to naturalism, you propose a sci scientism as a, a, one of your philosophical right, beliefs. Right. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, so ultimately, uh, again, the irony of naturalism is those who are attempting to free themselves from a creator and a god are really enslaving themselves to evolution because you're just a slave of your genes. There is no Jeremy. There is no Austin. You are just one of the products of evolution, and you're going to keep marching on, passing on your genes. There's no free will. And therefore, no free freedom to think well about your reality because you're locked in. You guys see that? Okay? So it's pretty crazy. Um, all right, now we're going to get into.
the scientific evidence against evolution, which is a lot of fun. So I want to do this as painlessly as possible because there's so many different routes we can go. Okay. Um, there are, although you won't hear about the, uh, the many objections to neo-Darwinism evolutionary theory, you won't hear about it. There are a bunch of scientists nowadays coming out saying, yeah, this theory is whack. Okay. Now this is a quick, um, what's the best way to explain this? This is a quick, uh, I guess, summarization of a document that has recently gone out, scientists all around the world coming out saying, we cannot accept uh, evolutionary theory. Go ahead, Nate. You good? Gem, are we good? Are we still recording? Or? Yeah. Okay. I'm skeptical of the claim. I'm skeptical. I'm skeptical. I'm skeptical. I'm skeptical. We are skeptical of claim. Okay, so this is the. Now you can, if you want to, you can go onto the website. It's called Descent from Darwinism. Um, and this is kind of like the main claim. We are skeptical of claims for the ability of random mutation and natural selection to account for the complexity of life. Careful examination of the evidence for Darwin, Darwinian theory should be encouraged. This is not a Christian document. This, these are PhDs, scientists, doctors all around the world. Finally, getting the courage to say, hey, this theory does not work anymore. How old is this, Mason? This document itself is very recent. Now, the video is 2019. Um, now, the video is not going to touch on it. It's just kind of highlighting this document and these scientists. It's only a minute. It's for the ability of random mutations and natural selection to account for the complexity of life. A careful examination of, of the evidence for Darwinian theory should be encouraged. Skeptical. 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 Of claims for the ability for the ability of random mutations and natural selection to account for the complexity. Complexity. The complexity. The complexity. To account for the complexity of life. Careful examination. 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 Of the evidence for Darwinian theory should be encouraged. Okay, this is not a Christian organization. It's very important I reiterate that. These men and women are not making these conclusions based on their Christian presuppositions. Most of them are probably atheists and agnostic, but they're just saying the evidence does not conclude Darwinian theory. Okay, um, so let me... Okay, yet we have in our mainstream people like Richard Dawkins, who says things like this. It is absolutely safe to say that if you meet somebody who claims not to believe in evolution, that person is ignorant, stupid, or insane. And he says in parentheses, or wicked, but I'd rather not consider that. This is what is in our mainstream public media, okay? Not what is actually the consensus among the scientific conferences, all right? You're ignorant, stupid, or insane. So we assume if there's these scientists making these crazy claims, then there has to be evidence for Darwinian theory and evolution, right? Um, now, again, I can't get into the weeds of this stuff too much. There's a lot here. I'm pulling a lot of this from Stephen Meyer and a lot of his presentations because he, he does a better job me, than me at compiling all this information. Yes? Was that quote by Richard Dawkins after or before his quote that we don't actually want to live? That was after. So that he made that quote of the fascist state in 2009. Um, oh, no, 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 I I'm sorry. 2006, he made that quote about the fascist state. This quote there is from 1989. So oh, this okay. quote's from before. From before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So is there evidence that he changed his, his view? Um, not, uh, he wrote, Richard Dawkins wrote The God Delusion. Right. Um, no, uh, so he's very adamant. Yeah. yeah, no, 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 he does, yeah. He's stuck, he's stuck in his atheism. Okay, so really quickly, here's what we're going to touch on today. In 2016, the Royal Society of London is a scientific conference. They gathered together to discuss that neo-Darwinism or evolutionary theory is insufficient in explaining how we have such a diverse array of species. 
All right. This guy, the scientist, he's a biologist, and I believe from Austria. His name is Gerd Mueller. He opened up the conference with all these scientists with a talk titled The Explanatory Deficits of the Modern Synthesis. Modern synthesis just refers to as neo-Darwinism or evolutionary theory. Okay? So in this conference, he's, it was pretty much these scientists gathering together, hey, we need a new theory or we need to embellish this theory because it doesn't work based on the evidence we're finding. He discusses issues such as the Cambrian explosion, which is pretty much an explosion of fossils that appeared in a short period of time completely diverse from one another. So there was no way that they could have existed in the same time period because they were so diverse in species. Again, this destroys the idea of gradual changes over time. Um, he, he talks about things such as complex genetic expressions. There were five total that he kind of touched on and really went into detail. We are going to briefly talk about two of those. Okay? Gerd Mueller. This is all, you can look it up, um, you can read more about it. Um, again, I'll point you to some better resources after this. This is not to be, uh, just a, as an important aside, this is not to be an exhaustible defense against evolution. Please, I hope this kind of piques your interest in searching out that the evidence is not in favor for evolutionary theory. And this just hopefully will kind of point, um, poke at that. Because myself, I grew up for most of my life thinking evolution is true because that's what I was taught. And who am I to go against what modern science says? This is not the case. We know the media likes to twist things. This is another example of that. Okay, so here we go. Okay, yeah, you guys, you guys good? Yeah. Follow me? Yes. Okay. So, Gerd Mueller, he talks about, one of the things he talks about, and Stephen Meyer really hits on it well, are the improbable odds of evolution actually occurring. Okay, so we're going to have to go down into some more theory. Okay, so I need you to follow me. We have, we have, okay, this is the dogma of Darwinism. Okay, I'm just going to write Darwinism. Okay. Okay. There is um, a process. How am I going to do this? Let's do it like this. Okay. When we going from DNA to traits, there's actually a, a more intricate process that happens, and we're just going to touch on that really briefly. Okay. So here's what happens. You have DNA. Now, guys, remember DNA is like the code. It's a software program for your genes, right? Now, DNA is translated by RNA. Okay. It's just kind of an intermediate intermediary um, translator. And it turns this code into proteins. Okay, so this is when the the DNA, the code itself, goes from code translated through RNA. We can write RNA here into proteins, and proteins is almost like the hardware. So let me give you an example. You have you have a genetic code for a certain type of cell wall. Here's the code. RNA will read the code and will turn that code into the specific protein, which is the hardware. Then these proteins will become the cell wall itself, that structure. You follow me? So DNA is like the software. The proteins it creates is like the hardware. OK? According to evolutionary theory, mutation is one, is one of the two main drivers for evolution. Now, it's important to remember, too, Natural selection does not alter the genetic code. It only favors what gets passed on. Mutation is what alters the genetic code. So when we're talking about diversity of species and why are humans so different than squirrels, it's because of mutation, okay, with natural selection on top of it. But it's through the random process of certain things going wrong in the replication program, thus creating new proteins that will create a new hardware. Right? Over time of this process, all of a sudden, something that didn't have a tail has a tail over this mechanism over and over again. Okay? And I want you to really think about this in terms that you can understand it. So um, you have on your sheet, um, I'll write it out. Okay? DNA is a language. We touched on that in an earlier class. Think about the sentence, I am sad. Okay? This is a code or a language that communicates something. Right? And based on that, you draw a conclusion. According to the mutation process, now this is a very simple sentence. If I were to randomly rearrange something, the odds are I might get something like I ma sad. Now, this is nonsense. This is not a functional protein. 
So just because, and Austin was touching on this earlier, just because you have a mutation does not mean that the protein you make will actually work, will actually be something that can be read. Right? The RNA will, so it gets mutated, the RNA will come to it, try to read it, and be like, this makes no sense. And it will move on. And it won't create a protein. Right? Um, a lot of the people who have issues with evolutionary theory are the biologists who also double as mathematicians um, and engineers. Because they know that a software program, a bunch of zeros and ones, if you mess with it anyway, you are more than likely to get some kind of nonsense code that doesn't do anything, rather than a new function. But the mutation selection theory is that it not only creates a new, uh, it messes with something, but it creates, it creates something, let's say, it removes the S and creates I am dad. Okay? Now, this itself, right, that makes sense. Okay? But the second question we need to ask is, in, in my analogy, does this make sense in the context, right, in the natural selective process? Even if I get a functioning protein, something that works, that doesn't mean it's going to be favored by natural selection. Right? Um, so for example, if I'm trying to tell you that I am sad, right, and I say I am dad, it makes no sense. Right? Even though it's a sentence that reads as a sentence. So I can have a mutation, I can create a protein, but that doesn't even mean that it's going to be favored by the natural selection process. You guys are following me, right? The theory of evolution is that through this mutation process, I create new proteins that are not only different and functional, they're actually better. And then through this mechanism over time and time and time, billions of years, you go from a species to another species. Because one change in a protein might change thick hair to light hair. That's it. We're not talking species yet. We're talking little change, same organism. This makes sense, right? Because the, the protein may be thinner in the mutation. Okay, but then it would have to happen over and over and over again to create a new species. Okay? I'm, going, I'm going somewhere with this. You guys are following me, right? Yeah. Okay. Douglas Axe, um, PhD um, at Caltech, um, does a lot of work with genetics, yada, yada, all that stuff. There will be more. Uh, I'll, I'll provide links and resources. Okay? So he studied the potentiality of random recombinations of genetic code or DNA that would form a protein that actually works, okay? Because, just because this mutates doesn't mean it creates something that can be read and actually form a protein. He found the odds of random mutation, okay? The odds of a random mutation forming a protein that actually creates or, um, a, a mutated genetic code that creates a protein that actually works is one out of 10 raised to the 77th power. Those are the odds that a random mutation will create a protein that works. Not even a protein that is selected by natural selection and increasing fitness, just a protein that will work. So if I go into the genetic code and I mess with it randomly, the odds are, th these are the odds that it actually creates a protein that works. You are more than likely to get a protein that, or, or to get a code that cannot turn into a protein and it just won't work and it'll die. The majority of mutations they kill the organism, or they, they um, render the, the specific length of code as useless. Okay? That's just for, again, listen, that's just for one protein that might change thick hair to thin hair. So then, but then someone will say, okay, well, yes, these odds are not good, but we're talking about billions of years, time and time again, over and over again. Okay. Steven Meyer does a great job at explaining this. I'm going to try to do it justice, but I probably won't. He says, okay, the theory, or, or um, we have theorized that there have been about a total of 10 raised to the 40th power of organisms that have ever existed. Ever. Okay? Now, that's a very loose figure, okay? but um, it might vary by one of these up or down. Okay? There have been about this many organisms to ever exist on the Earth including the thousands of an, um, uh, insects and amoebas and every organism that has ever existed on Earth about this number here. Understand, the chance for mutation occurs when there is a replication event, when the DNA is being passed on to the next um, organism, right? So that means that there have been about this many replication events. Are you following me? Right? Because every time I create another organism, it's a chance for mutation chance for a new protein, okay? 
So if you had this many chances to get this many odds, okay, a little bit of math here, it would, it would look like this. Just go like that. Look like this. 10 to the 40th over 10 to the 77th, right? If I had this many chances to get this many odds, I get 10 to the 37th power. This is still an astronomical figure. Okay, I can't really begin to explain how crazy this is. This number is, even given the billions of years and the many species that have occurred throughout all of time, the odds of you getting, this is a functional protein. This is not a new species. This is thick hair versus thin hair. The odds of getting that are 1 to 10 raised to the 37th power, which is 10, 1 in 10 trillion trillion trillionth. The odds for a new protein. And, like Austin said, this is assuming that every organism mutated when it replicated. Mutations are rare in general. Go ahead, Jesse. What is the prerequisite to that? Is that for one specific species, which would um, branch out to, to every, every uh, other? Or is that one specific species and then that same phenomenal occurrence occurring again? Yes. And again, and again, and again, and again. To not only account for one organism turning into another organism, another species, but for all of the species, about 8 million total species that have ever existed. Go ahead. So we're basically saying that that number, the 1 out of 10 trillion, 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 um, for one protein, which can be attributed to what in an organism? So like, say Going from thick hair to thin hair. So I would say like there like we said like fish to like lizard or something right? How no. Do fish get on land, but it would be like the first protein in the nub that would be. And and not even that proteins um, function as like think about a protein changing for the cell wall. We're talking about a mutation that would affect maybe the elasticity of your skin. Right. That's it. Those are the odds of that happening. Over and over again. So then you're saying over and over again that fish is going to grow legs and start walking on land. It's absolute absurdity, right. which is why at that 2016 conference, they said, hey, we need a new theory. This doesn't work. This is the real science. But again, you have Richard Dawkins say, if you don't believe in evolution, you're stupid and even wicked. Again, public thought, mob mentality, it's the devil. When we get into the truth and the facts of the matter, that is not the case. Okay. Is, has Stephen Meyer <clears throat> been challenged with the, his 10th to the 40th? Number for the number of species. So this is actually not. Stephen Meyer compiles this stuff. Oh, okay. These are these are most of these people are not even Christians. Okay. So, so they're just doing honest yeah. science. Okay. Um, this ten to the fortieth. I mean, again, even if you want to say there was more species, let's say you want to say there was ten to the fiftieth, that still makes this number ten raised to the twenty seventh for one protein. It doesn't even make sense. It, it, you can't even begin to to make this work. It doesn't work. When you don't look into the actual facts, it kind of sounds nice. And it allows you to exclude a creator from your worldview. But when you actually get into it, it literally makes no sense for the diversity of species that we have. But I think we can see that like finches and people can evolve. There's evolution in, in, in each species, but we didn't all originate from one single Micro amoeba. Micro yeah. Right, yeah. and microevolution, which again is a deceiving term. And it's a deceiving term because all it is is an adaptation, right? It's not, it's, it's not creation of new genes. The adaptations we observe are selection of genes that already existed, right? The beak type already existed and just gets perpetuated. That's what we observe. But we do not see a creation of new code that creates a better hardware. Yeah. We don't see it. Yeah. And it's, it's so improbable, it's not even, it's laughable. Uh, with, with a virus which infects its host and alters the um, its host at a cellular level, ultimately, how does that even fit into it, this equation? How does that you know, even kick off evolution? A virus that would get into its host? Are you saying like a virus that might create a mutation? Cause evolution. Mm -hmm. And you control populations and. Well, Right, to that point, 
the odds of a mutation itself are, are crazy. The, the, we, we don't see mutations often, and when we do, they're usually nonsense deletion mutations, which means that if you had a code, right, let's say the genetic code is CAG. Now, these stand for amino acids, right? Um, DNA is a list of, of amino acids. A typical mutation we'll see is it'll just go like this. And then now this code is, you cannot read this code. So then the RNA will skip over it, and it won't create the protein. That's what we see. Very and very rarely. Why would that be used as a, as a defensive evolution? I, I looked up vi a virus and it, it permanently affects the you know, um, species. Yeah. In a negative manner. Yeah. Positive. Right. Yeah. So uh, why would that be used as a defense? Why would that? It's a it's a it's a poor attempt. Yeah. Um. Well, uh, hold on for a second. Yeah. I'm going to get into one more. So. So I had, so this is um, going off of uh, Gerd Mueller, right? He used this demonstration. He had four other ones of different nature. He, the, this is the improbability argument. Then he has many other ones, right? The other one I want to briefly touch on, we don't have to get into too much detail because I want to address questions, um, it, are epigenetics. Epigenetics, um, I want to do this justice, so I'm just going to read from my paper. Um, Okay, epigenetics refers to information of directing cell processes that are not in your genes. So for example, um, epigenetics refers to directing cell processes that are not coded in your DNA. So, so for example, DNA will code for the creation of, let's say, a cell, a certain type of cell, right? So here's the blueprints for that cell, a skin cell, let's say. But now, how does that skin cell know to form a hand as I'm developing in my mom's womb? How, what directs it to literally become a hand? What directs my, it, my intestines from becoming in, ribbed intestines? Those are called epigenetics. The coding for literally the, um, the body plan of an organism is not in DNA, which means it's not passed on. There is some kind of mechanism, and, and um, Stephen Meyer lists a bunch of them. I have some examples here if you want to do more research. But these, these um, what you call it? Uh, these epigenetics um, functions are not in your genes. So meaning you cannot pass it on and perpetuate your species. The fact that we have fingers and hands, the fact that we are four-limbed creatures, not just that we have skin cells, that the skin cells know where to go to form a being is not in the genes. So therefore, evolutionary theory cannot explain why there are Rent, like humans, and then there's the completely different, I don't know, let's say, worm. How, do, how did that happen? How did the cells get directed to form these things? That's, they're not in the DNA. So it's not in the program. How could it get passed on? It's absurdity. And it immediately goes back to, I stitch you in your mother's womb. I knew you before you were born. There is no, we have no rhyme or reason to why we have hands, to why it's incredible. Literally, you admit when you say, yeah, epigenetics, we don't know. Yeah, we know how the cells come about. We don't know how it gets stitched into this shape that is a human. Because there's one who's stitching it. Mm -hmm. It's incredible. Crazy stuff. Okay, again, this, is, this was the opening talk at a conference by a non-Christian scientist who only used five points. I only gave you two. There's three more to his one talk that kick off the whole conference. So you could imagine the, the, the wealth of information out there that shows why evolution is not a good theory anymore. Um, I listed some quotes here. Um, a lot of these quotes are older. So, I mean, you could take it or leave it if you want. But again, it kind of one of the cool ones I like is Sir Arthur Keith. It's the third one from the last quote. He, he was an anthropologist, and this is interesting. He wrote the foreword for the 100th year anniversary of On the Origin of Species. And in that foreword, he wrote, evolution is unproved and unprovable. We believe it because, it is the, only, because the only alternative is special creation, and that is unthinkable. <laughs> this was in the foreword to On the Origin of Species. He's literally a proponent of Darwinism. He says, I mean, it's unproved and unprovable because of what it is. He was being honest with the theory. But he says, but the only other option is that we are specially created, and that's just unthinkable. <laughs> Takes more faith to believe in that than an intelligent mind. 
Um, I, there's a bunch of other defenses of why evolution doesn't make sense. Evolution does not account for consciousness in the mind. The fact that we think in an immaterial reality does not, is not explained by material genes. How does genes dictate consciousness? It's an immaterial reality. We don't have to get into that, though. Um, but again, that's, that's stuff that fascinates me. So um, here's how I want to wrap up. I've had many of these conversations with friends. In college, I have a lot of atheist evolutionary theory friends. I studied biology, and I was saved halfway through that. So I'm like, hey, I don't think evolution actually is a theory. You can imagine what that caused. <laughs> so I dug into my research. I, I, I looked at a lot of this stuff. Most of the time, I get this. Well, then why do people still believe it? Why do the scientists still believe evolutionary theory? If it's so absurd, why do they believe it? I want to show you this is a, a good clip. Exactly, right. The other alternative is just absurd, right? And, and it implies accountability to a judge. Um, uh, so this clip I'm going to show you, in this group of people, one of them is Stephen Meyer, who I really encourage you guys to look into. Two of them are David Berlinski and David Gelertner. Berlinski and Gelertner are not Christians. Ber um, Meyer is. They're not Christians. They're agnostic, and, and I think they're both agnostic, so they just don't know what's out there. But they were bold enough to say, in the face of the evidence, that Darwinism is absurd. It's not based on Christian presuppositions. It's just based on where the evidence leads. Um, right now, Gelertner, I don't know how to say it, Gelertner, he's some kind of PhD mathematician guy. He's, he was convinced that Darwinism is not true based on Stephen Meyer's book. So Gertlerner read Meyer's book, said, wow, you straight up proved that evolution is not true. And then he now publicly rejects Darwinism. And I think he's a professor at Yale. And now has received, because he publicly rejects Darwinism, his friends scrutinize him you know, for, that, for that perspective. So right now, he, he's being quoted in his book review of, Darwin, of uh, Meyer's book. I'm going to quote you once again, David Gelerentner. Darwinism is no longer just a scientific theory, but the basis of a world view and an emergency religion for the many troubled souls who need one, close quote. Now, lots of people have invested lots of energy in discrediting Dr. Berlinski and Dr. Meyer over the years. You, Dr. Galantner, are a professor of unquestioned competence and achievement in computer science. And computer science is with it, baby. It is right at the middle of the new world we're creating. It's technocracy. We don't have to ask ultimate questions. We just have to deal with zeros and ones. It's totally rational. It's producing a cornucopia of new wealth. And now Galerentner goes over to the other side? He's so, been with us all along. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what's the reception? Been. Been Traitor. at New Haven and, and in your profession, in academia? I mean, that's a serious uh, question. What's going on? Yeah, okay. I, um, I have to make a distinction between the, the way I've been treated personally, which is in a very courteous and collegial way by my colleagues at Yale. They're nice guys, and I like them. They're, they're my friends. On the other hand, when I look at, at their intellectual behavior, what they publish, and much more important, what they tell their students, um, Darwinism has indeed passed beyond a scientific argument as far as they are concerned. You take your life in your hands to challenge it intellectually. Yes. They will destroy you if you challenge it. Now, I haven't been destroyed. I'm not a biologist, and you know, I don't claim to be an authority on this topic. But, um, and you know, a book review is not the same as a book. It's, to, it's to sort of a satellite around the book. A anyway, it remains a case. I have nothing personally to charge my colleagues with, but what I've seen in their behavior intellectually and at colleges across the West is nothing approaching free speech on this topic, is a bitter rejection, not just a, a, a sort of a bitter, fundamental, uh, angry, outraged, violent rejection, which comes nowhere near scientific or intellectual discussion. I've seen that happen again and again. I'm a Darwinism. Don't you say a word against it or we'll, or I don't want to hear you, period. Which proves that you're attacking 
their religion, in effect. I am attacking their argue. religion, and I don't blame them for being all head up. It is a big issue for them, unquestionably. Dr. Berlin. That's just touching on the idea, if, if it's so absurd, then why do people still believe it? And you will be attacked intellectually. Stephen Meyer, he's a geologist, he has his PhD in a bunch of stuff. You, you Google him, he's a pseudoscientist, which pseudo meaning false or fake, because he proposes that intelligent design is a better theory than Darwinism, even though Darwinism is illogical and improbable. But they label him as pseudoscientist, so you look, oh, well, that's pseudoscience. I'm just going to listen to the, the mainstream. And that's what happened to Galeritner. His, intellectually, his colleagues were like, they wrote him off. And he said, you get a bitter, almost angry rejection if you even ask questions against Darwinism in the West. And that's the problem we're facing. I want to close with Romans 1. For God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all godlessness and unrighteousness of people who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Since what can be known about God is evident among them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, that is, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen since the creation of the world, being understood through what he has made. As a result, people are without excuse. For though they knew God, they did not glorify him as God or show gratitude. Instead, their thinking became nonsense and their senseless, senseless minds were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, birds, four-footed four animals, and reptiles. Therefore, God delivered them over in the cravings of their hearts to sexual impurity so that their bodies were degraded among themselves. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served something created instead of the Creator who is praised forever. Amen. <laughs> this was like prophetic. Now, he was talking about the paganism of the time, but I, this perfectly fits evolution. Perfectly fits worshipping and praising something created instead of the Creator. The praise is evolution. Not the, the glorious creator who crafted our hands, crafted the birds. I can't imagine how much of a slap in the face it is to say that all of the diversity of species was the result of random chaotic forces. Just like saying the Mona Lisa is a result of spilling my paint. <laughs> Meanwhile, you, you put all this time into your artwork that you beautifully express yourself through. And we have the nerve to say random chances. Because you don't want to submit to a creator. It's the fulfillment of Romans uh, 1 here. That's why people believe evolution, human nature, not because of evidence. Do me a favor and drop your marker real quick. Just drop it. Oh, come on, stop. Drop it. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So here are the questions. Um, I realize I did not ask your questions for the homework just because this was a lot, and so I just I didn't want to, um, you know, overload you guys with time. Um, Darwin's Doubt by Stephen Meyer. If you're still skeptical, please check this out. Um, scientism and secularism, another great one with more on the philo uh, philosophical ends of things. I'll send, I'll send a link. A theistic Evolution is another good one. It's, it's a big book, um, but it's, it's really um, exhaustive on the topics. Um, I'm going to send a link to an hour lecture of Stephen Meyer where I pulled a lot of his stuff from that and kind of incorporate some other stuff, but he does a fantastic job, and he is authoritative on this topic. Um, he oversees something called the Discovery Institute, which is dedicated towards exposing these lies. We should be confident in our creator. It, this Amen. evolution doesn't make sense. Absolutely. Okay, any questions before we break, guys? So is there, is there any work done on why we continue to have such variation rather than return to less variation, if we're actually surviving, if it's a question of fitness, wouldn't you? Ex wouldn't there logically be an expectation that there's less variation in mankind, right? Because we would be more and more similar over time. <sighs> is, is there any work being done on, on this? I mean, I don't know. I, I can't speak to that. It's but But again, random mutation and natural selection provide the, the explanatory account of why there's such variation. Uh, are you saying that why aren't we, why aren't we coming to a similar, well because- why is there a conversion of traits if there, because there are certain, because there are, I would imagine, specific traits that are more conducive to fitness, right, than others. So the others get washed away. Now, in defense of the evolutionist, right. we're talking billions of years, different, climates on the earth, mutations. So 
they can use the excuse to say, well, during the Ice Age, natural selection favored differently than during the 21st century in America. Mm -hmm. And they hide behind the smoke screen of saying a billions of years. They just throw that up there to, to kind of like protect against like right. the odds. But again, they can't escape the amount of species or the amount of organisms that have lived. So, so they, they, it's inextricably tied to the, to the older the billions of years. They need that. Well, that's when evolutionary theory actually influenced the way we interpret the age of the earth, which that's a rabbit hole too. Because now you start to see how scientists will reinterpret the age of the earth so that they can fit evolutionary theory. So now, they, you, you kind of see it now, which is why when you say, oh, I'm a, I'm a young earther, people are like, oh, that's absurd. But actually, the, um, the history of the, the world is kind of dictated by the presupposition that evolution is true. So it's an interesting thing. If you want to dig more into that, um, I have one of the books there. Actually, Jesse uh, brought it up. Uh, it's The Advancement by L. Russ Bush. I think his first name is Lester, or something like that. The Advancement, Keeping the Faith in an Evolutionary Age. He exposes how scientists did geological studies based on the evolutionary theory. There was this one specific study where he was, he was studying the, um, the rate at which the Ice Age melted. And According to the organisms that they found in the ice, I'm probably butchering this, but pretty much he tested it objectively. And he got this timeline of like, I don't know, let's say, uh, this is speculation, but let's say 5,000 years. But he realized for evolutionary theory to work, it couldn't be 5,000 years, it had to be like 5 million years. So he went back to the same lake, it got samples from all around the lake to try to find evidence for a longer timeline. The most he could get was like 10,000 years. But he, he went back to the, to the lake to find new evidence because he wanted it to fit according to evolutionary theory. Right. So now evolutionary theory is now not only this crazy false theory, it also dictated how we do science in other areas. It's the devil. Mm -hmm. It's the devil. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you guys have questions, you can come up to me. Um, two more classes after this, okay? Uh,